Hi guys, I wanted to uh, put a couple of example problems up from your homework on this section 4.6 where we're sketching curves uh, using our, our um, knowledge from previous years and from calculus. All right. This is number 4 on page 253. I'm given f of x equals x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. All right. I know this is a rational function, so the first thing I always identify are my horizontal asymptotes. So because this is equal degree, I know I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals, well, because it's equal degrees, and it's just the ratio of my coefficients, so 1, all right? So on a graph, I'll go ahead and put that horizontal asymptote in. So at x equal, or y equals 1, I draw this horizontal line, all right? Uh, the numerator doesn't factor, so I know that nothing will cancel out of the top and bottoms. There are no holes, but let's take a look at vertical asymptotes. I know vertical asymptotes are values that make my denominator 0, uh, that aren't holes, and so wouldn't that be x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2? Okay, so I'll graph those now. Vertical lines here and here. Okay, now uh, let's go and try and find some y intercepts. To find a y intercept, I know I plug 0 in for y, I'm sorry, for x, and I see what y is. So 0, comma. Well, if I put a 0 here and here, don't I just get negative 1 fourth for my y-intercept? So I know my graph will cross at 0, comma, negative 1 fourth here. All right? For x-intercepts, well, again, I put 0 in for y this time and solve for x. But when you do that, and I'm just going to show the work and then erase it, I get 0 equals x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. Cross multiplying the denominator across, that disappears, correct? So I just get the numerator equals 0, right? But when I go to solve this numerator equal to 0, don't I get uh, negative 1 equals x squared? And when I square root, wouldn't it become an imaginary value? So because of that, I realize there are no x-intercepts, right? So I know I won't be crossing this x-axis anywhere, right? So now... I've done my horizontal asymptotes, my vertical asymptotes, my y-intercept, and my x-intercepts. I've got to go now to uh, the calculus portion of this. So let me minimize all the stuff that we've already created and go to the calculus portion. Actually, before we do that, I do want to, I do want to point something out, just kind of common sense. Since I didn't have any x-intercepts, if I go look at this graph over here, I know that this curve cannot touch this x-axis anywhere. So does that make sense that these branches on the left side of this vertical asymptote and the branch on the right of this vertical asymptote, well, those can't be downward. So in my mind, in mind, I, I know that this probably is going to come in like something like this, correct? And on this side, something like, oops, something like this, correct? Does that make sense? And probably in the middle, since I can't go above that x-axis, it's probably going to be like some kind of parabolic-looking middle here, right? Since I'm not allowed to have an x-intercept. But now let's find out using calculus. All right, so the first thing I need to do is find the derivative of my original function. So let's go do that now. Okay, so taking a look, this is the derivative of this function. Now, to find my critical values, don't I set my, uh, my, uh, my derivative equal to 0 and solve for x? So I get negative 10x over x squared minus 4 squared equaling zero. So would you would you agree that the numerator is the only thing I need to set equal to zero and solve? So wouldn't you just get x equals zero? So I know I have a critical value at x equals zero. Placing this critical value on a number line, I'll now test a number on each side of zero to see whether I'm increasing or decreasing in the interval. So I'm going to plug in negative one into my derivative. That derivative was f prime of x equals negative 10x over x squared minus 4 squared, I get uh, the derivative at, at, at negative 1 is 10 ninths. Now again, because that's a positive value, I know that to the left of 0, my slope is positive, or my derivative is positive. So I must be going uphill, right? Now, let's test, test the number to the right of 0. Let's plug in a positive 1, right? Well, I'm just going to do this quickly. If I plugged in a positive 1 here, replacing these negatives with positive ones, wouldn't I get now negative 10 in the numerator? 
and I would still get positive 9 on the denominator. So wouldn't that be negative 10 ninths is my overall uh, value of that, of that derivative? So I know at 1, the derivative is equal to a negative number. So I must be going downhill to the right of 0. So what does that mean? That must mean that I'm in on the interval between this, uh, this asymptote on the left, negative 2, and this value of x equals 0. So from negative 2 to 0, I must be increasing. To the right of 0 and to this asymptote uh, 2, I must be decreasing. Okay, so I know that this graph will have to go up to this maximum value and down on the other side of it. So I've just figured out this middle portion of my graph. Now I've got to come over to the branch on the left side of this vertical asymptote. Okay, now although negative 2 isn't a critical value, I know that I have to have some type of function on this side. It's either going to be going up like this or down like this. All right. Well, does it make sense that I could again test any number in this interval, plug the uh, plug the derivative in, uh, plug that value into the derivative, and see what kind of slope I get? If I get a positive slope, I must be increasing on that interval, and if I get a negative value on this interval uh, for the derivative, I must be decreasing on the interval. So let's take a look. If I evaluate the uh, derivative, it's a negative three. What kind of slope do I get? Well, wasn't the derivative of this negative 10x over x squared minus 4 squared? So plugging in a negative 3, let's see, in the numerator I would get, uh, let's see here, positive 30. And in the denominator I would get, uh, again, well that would be 100 minus 4, which is 96. But 96 squared is some positive value. And I really don't, again, I don't care about what that actual number is. I just care if I get a positive or a negative. So if I take positive 30 and divide it by a positive big number, I know I'm going to get a positive value for my derivative. All right? So I know that at negative 3, since my slope must be increasing, all right, I must be going up from left to right in this way. Okay? So I know now that this graph, this portion of my graph, would go up as I hug that asymptote, as I get closer to that asymptote, okay? Similarly, on this side of my uh, asymptote at x equals 2, now I've got to pick a number on this side of the asymptote, say 3, okay? Again, I'm going to put a positive 3 in for my derivative, so it's a quick fix. I'm just going to go ahead and put a plus here and a plus here, all right? And then wouldn't that give me, let's see here, a, uh, let's see here, a negative 10 times positive 3 is negative 30, right? And I would still get a positive on the bottom because when I square the, this denominator, it become positive. So in this case, instead of getting a negative number for my slope, I get, instead of getting a positive number for my slope, I'm sorry, I get a negative number for my slope, right? So since my slope is negative on this side, I know I must be decreasing on this side, so I must be going down in this direction. So wait, that must mean I could add a couple more intervals. Instead of just saying I'm increasing from negative 2 to 0 in the middle, I'm also increasing, wouldn't you say, from negative infinity to negative 2? And I'm decreasing on the interval from 2 to infinity. Okay? All right, so I figured out my increases and in my decreasing from my um, first derivative. Now let's take a look at concavity. Okay, so here's the second derivative. Now, again, to find my um, points of inflection, I would set this derivative equal to the second derivative equal to zero. Again, the denominator would just cancel out when I set um, when I cross multiply it. But again, let it make sense, guys. If I subtracted the 40, divided by 30, and then square rooted, I know I would be square rooting a negative 30 over 40. And when you do that, that's imaginary. 
So does it make sense there will be no points of inflection on this graph? Again, there will no be, be no place where concavity changes. So now I need to use my asymptotes again, x equals negative 2 and x equals 2, to test the concavity for the branches in the left, in the middle, and on the right. Okay, so let's do that. Plugging in a number to the left of negative 2 into the second derivative, say negative 3. <clears throat> let's see here. I know I would get, <coughs> let's see here. Uh, F double prime would equal at uh, negative 3. Let's see, 30 times negative 3 squared plus 40 over negative 3. Uh, squared minus 4 cubed. Well, that would give me, let's see, on the numerator, I, and again, all I care about is the, the positive or the negative of each. So let's see, when I square the negative 3, that's a positive, and positive times 30 is still positive, and positive plus 40 is positive. So I know I'm going to get a positive number in the numerator. In the denominator, well, let's see, that becomes negative 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 4 is 5, and 5 cubed, again, is a positive number, right? So I know that if I evaluate the second derivative at negative 3, I get a positive value. Well, again, doesn't that mean that, that I must be concave up on the interval from negative infinity to negative 2, right? So I'm concave up. from, let's see, let's erase this, negative infinity to negative 2. All right? Okay, now, let's see here. Let's test the interval between negative 2 and positive 2. So let's put 0 into my second derivative. If I put 0 into my second derivative, I would simply get, well, let's see here. On the numerator, 0 squared is 0, and 0 times 30 is 0, and 0 plus 40 is 40. So in the numerator of my fraction, I know I'd get a positive number. Well, in the denominator, 0 squared is 0, and 0 minus 4 is negative 4, and negative 4 cubed, well, that's negative 64, so that's a negative number. So I know in this denominator, I get a negative, so positive divided by a negative is negative. So since my second derivative is negative, I know I must be concave down on that interval between the two, uh, the two vertical asymptotes. And then lastly, picking a number in the interval to the right of 2, say again 3, and plugging that number in, let's see what I get. Plugging in a 3, no, oh, sorry, to my second derivative, I get a 3 here and a 3 here. And again, I think as you can see, I'm going to get a positive in the numerator. A positive in the denominator. So my overall second derivative is positive when x equals 3. Well again, because that's positive, that must mean I'm concave up on the interval from 2 to infinity. All right, so let's fill in here. I can add in that I'm, po that I'm concave up on the interval of 2 to infinity. Okay, and so I've done all my concavity there, right? And that's pretty much everything that we can figure out about this graph. And again, as you can see, this is what the graph looks like. All right, just to, just a measure. Let's see what the graph uh, of this looks like on a calculator. This is this is the graph of that. Oh, and again, as you can see, that that that's that's pretty good on uh, compared to um, the graph that I just got by hand. Okay, all right. I hope this helps. Talk to you later.